On today's show, we talk to two-time Grammy-winning saxophonist and composer Ted Nash on his musical development from young, developing his writing, his remarkable playing career with people such as Lionel Hampton, Wynton Marsalis, Mel Lewis, and many more, his double Grammy award-winning work, Presidential Suite, his latest album, Ted Nash Quintet, live at Dizzy's Club, Coca-Cola, and much, much more. Stay tuned. You're listening to The Nikhil Hogan Show. Welcome back to the Nikhil Hogan Show. We have such a great guest today. We have two-time Grammy winner, saxophonist, arranger, composer, Ted Nash is with us on the show today. He was born in Los Angeles to a musical family. His father, trombonist Dick Nash, and uncle, the late saxophonist Ted Nash, were both well-known jazz and studio musicians. Nash started playing piano at the age of seven before learning the clarinet at 12, the alto sax at 13. As a high school student, he studied jazz improvisation with vibraphonist Charlie Shoemake, and he got his first real break at 16 when he was hired by Lionel Hampton for a one-week gig in Hawaii. By the time he reached 17, Nash had played lead alto for Quincy Jones's band and was performing regularly with the bands of Louis Belson, Toshiko Akiyoshi, and Don Ellis. Turning 18, he recorded his first date as a leader, Conception for Concord Jazz, and made a permanent move to New York, where he soon became a member of the Jerry Mulligan Big Band. In the 80s, he was featured as a sideman on albums by Shoemake and Shelley Mann before joining the Mel Lewis Jazz Orchestra and working as both a soloist and arranger for that unit. The 90s found him leading his own quartet, working as a sideman for Louis Belson, Wynton Marsalis, Joe Lovano, and bassist Ben Allison, who also hired Nash for the music of the pianist Herbie Nichols. In the 90s, Nash recorded as a leader for Maple Shade and the French Elibeth label. After the turn of the millennium, he's recorded both as a leader and sideman for Palmetto. His recordings have received wide critical acclaim, appearing on the best of lists in the New York Times, The New Yorker, The Village Voice, and The Boston Globe. Portrait in Seven Shades, his first big band recording, garnered two Grammy nominations. His following big band album, Chakra, received critical acclaim and charted on Billboard. He received two Grammy Awards for Presidential Suite, his most significant work recently, uh, inspired by great political speeches of the 20th century, dealing with the theme of freedom, and is read by significant figures from the world of entertainment, politics, and sports, including the actors Glenn Close, Sam Waterston, Ambassador Andrew Young, Senator Joe Lieberman, authors Deepak Chopra, Douglas Brinkley, and many, many more. He's the co-founder of the New York-based Jazz Composers Collective, a musician-run nonprofit entity dedicated to presenting the original works of composers pushing the boundaries of their self-expression. Nash is also a long-standing member of the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra with Wynton Marsalis. His latest album is the Ted Nash Quintet, live at Dizzy's, released 2018. Ted, welcome to the show. Wow, thank you, thank you. It's <laughs> an great. epic I've... intro, right? <laughs> but we, man, we you've don't had... even have to do the interview now. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but man, I'm telling you, you have an epic career. So I want to dive into a couple of things. And let's actually start when you first learned jazz improvisation. Now, it says here you studied with Charlie Shoemake, but your uncle and your dad were great musicians as well. Did they teach you improvisation, or is that something you picked up on your own, or was it with your, with your teacher, Charlie Shoemake? Well... It's funny because I really wanted to be a classical clarinetist at first. So my my dream was to be a classical clarinetist and maybe perhaps do studio work like my dad and my uncle. They were very, very busy doing um, film music, TV, all of that, and a lot of records. I mean, my uncle's, my, between the two of them, they've probably been, been on over a thousand movies and and all that. <laughs> I mean, that's astonishing. That's really astonishing that the two brothers, actually, could you name some standout films or, or shows that, that they've played on? I mean, it might be too numerous to name. Well, it's interesting because my uh, my uncle actually wrote a book, which we've self-published after his, after his passing. And I think the most interesting part of the book is his appendix, where he lists every single thing that he did. He he kept uh, the most uh, amazing r- uh, records of every date that he did. But just, I mean, I can just say that if you know the Mancini, all the Mancini films, and from Breakfast at Tiffany's to all the way all the way through everything that he did, including the early TV shows, they were they did pretty much everything of Mancini's. But if you think about John Williams, my father did all of his stuff until he started using classical orchestras. 
Jerry Goldsmith, Bill Conti, Johnny Mandel, the Americanization of Emily, which the song Emily comes from. My uncle's on that. So they were they were truly amazing musicians. They just had this gift for playing melodies, playing, um, being able to read anything, play anything. And it was an attractive, I would say an attractive career to look at because they did well financially. Uh, they seemed to get a lot of respect from their peers and people outside of just musicians still seem to know about them and follow their careers. Do they bring home any cool musicians to hang out with? Oh my God, yeah. Oh yes. I mean, I can tell you about the parties. I'm going back to just when I was getting started improvising and playing solos and stuff. But in the time that I was from my being aware of anything to, to being um, fully uh, invested improviser in my teens, I mean, I can remember the wild parties we had. My parents were civil rights activists. So we had um, parties, fundraisers, meetings. We had the Black Panthers at the house. We had a lot of different groups of people, with, uh, uh, you know, like the Charles Gary, the, the attorney um, was there. Then the musicians, as I started to understand who was coming, like Carmen McRae, uh, Sonny Chris, the alto player, Sonny Chris would be there. Um, we had uh, Yvonne Linz and... and uh, Oscar Castroneves, I remember jamming with them on the song Wave on the flute. And it's like, <laughs> I didn't even know who they were at the time. But like, they're some of the heaviest Brazilian composers and players. So no, the household was just filled with with music and of all kinds, because my mother liked some, some styles yeah, of music. Yeah, I read your, brother, your mom was a jazz musician as well. She was a fantastic singer. And I think she really could have been, she could have had a career as a singer had she not the combination of things of number one, raising kids, being a mom and sort of feeling like that was her path. And I think truly she was a bit scared and daunted by the idea of being a professional singer and what all the responsibilities that are attached to that. And I think she chose a path that was uh, more, maybe in some ways more satisfying for her, but she was a fantastic singer, would always sing at our parties. Quick question. Now you have, you come from such a musical family do you have perfect pitch, or is it developed relative pitch? <laughs> um, see, no, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> first, I can't sing, so even if I had perfect pitch, you wouldn't know. I don't have perfect pitch. I, I always say I don't have perfect pitch, pitch because I'm pretty sure I don't, and um, I've proven that many times. Uh, I, have, I have very good relative pitch. And I can hear qualities really well and intervals really well. So I think that's really important as an improviser. Maybe... Maybe it's a more important thing to have as a, as a jazz improviser than perfect pitch. I think um, perfect pitch can help so much if you're just coming in cold to something and you want to grab a note or you hear something. And I do know people with perfect pitch, and they are they have a tremendous ability that helps them in so many ways. Um, but I think relative pitch is really important. Um, and as an improviser, I mean, you did ask about, about how I got started, and my... My teacher, Charlie Shoemaker, who you mentioned, is a vibes player, and he plays piano as well. And he's the one I studied improvisation with, and it started by memorizing great jazz solos, Charlie Parker. Oh, this, is, this is crazy. You, you said in an interview that you memorized something like a ridiculous number of solos. Now, could you talk about that? Yeah. You know, it's, it, you get your Saturday afternoon lesson, and all <laughs> week you're working on this, and you're not thinking that much about it, but over a period of like three years, I would say, where my goal was to memorize a solo, my lesson was to memorize a solo, one one per week. And, you know, maybe I if many times it was one per two weeks, whatever. But over that period of three years, I've probably memorized 80 to 100 um, bebop solos, basically. Now, wait, when you say uh, the solo, are you talking about how many choruses would that typ typically be? Um might be like three choruses of Charlie Parker Blues or, or one or two choruses of I Got Rhythm or a standard. So... Uh, you know, and I just then just by sheer it's it's so it's crazy. And this is why I think a lot of people when they don't spend time transcribing and playing other people's music in the beginning, they don't develop the strong language. This this basically gives you the language. Look, back then they didn't have the omni book, right? So did you transcribe how did you did you slow down records or did you did your teacher show it to you? Well, you know, we didn't have digital equipment. Back. This is like mid-70s. So when I'm 15, 14, um, I would just slow the, put the LP down to a slower 
and that that would help. Or uh, my teacher did most of the transcribing. So in in in, a, in the regular lessons, ordinarily he would hand me a transcribed solo. So I didn't do the transcription work for my lessons. But on the, my, you know, when I would hear something, I'd be like, "What is that? I want to know what that is." I would transcribe it myself. And sometimes it takes a long time, you know. And then, I mean, you know, you've done that. It's the single line thing starts to get faster because you hear groups of notes. Like at first, you're like getting each note. Then you're getting well. You understand the phrase. You've heard it. You've heard people do this because it's a language. So you hear da 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 whatever, and then you just write that out, the whole thing. You can write out eight notes at a time if you if you really understand what's happening. So it can go faster and faster as you gain more ability with the language. Then I turn to trying to do chordal stuff like Herbie Hancock. I remember spending 12 hours transcribing the intro to Siora. And, uh, wait, wait, tw- that- wait, talk about that. That that's really interesting. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what? So you had the record and you just sat down and worked at it for uh, it seems like a really long time. Is that is that is that accurate? Yeah. Well, you know, it, again, it goes back to my childhood and my parents and the civil rights act, act activities they were doing because we had these parties that I was mentioning, and we Mo- Motown, some kind of jazz stuff. Stevie Wonder, certain pop stuff would be primarily what was happening at these parties. I would say mostly on the Motown side. Um, and then at a certain point, people would say, cornbread, put on cornbread. <laughs> and that was the name of Lee Morgan's record. But what they wanted to hear was that one song, Siora. Boop, 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 boop. Started off with Herbie Hancock. Boo, boo, bee. Boo, 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 bee, doo, doo. It's like the most perfect intro to a song. It's one chorus, improvised intro. And as a kid, I didn't even know what improvisation was. I thought everything everybody played was a melody or written out. So, you know, when you're young, you don't, oh, if the guy's improvising. No, you just hear the sound of the music. So I always thought that was the song, that Herbie Hancock intro. But then, of course, later, when I'm a, a jazz musician, and this was, I was in my 20s, I believe, uh, I was like, this is a magical, this is a magical minute of music that um, is not only perfect in so many ways harmonically, uh, musically, but also reminds me of my childhood is very nostalgic. Reminds me of my parents. Reminds me of these parties and my childhood and all that. So it was more just it, it it was more than just trying to learn the notes and the chords. It was it was it was embracing something that gave me a feeling that is deeply connected to my childhood. So it, I felt like that whole day that I spent doing it was, was worth every bit of uh, musical and emotional sort of responses that I, that I got from it. Now, here's the thing. A lot of students, they, they understand the need for transcription, but how do you t- extract vocabulary and play around with the note with solos? Because at a certain point, you, you would have to, you have to cut it up, right? And kind of, use different parts of solos, maybe in different sections and try to experiment. Did you, when did you start to really feel really creative of building lines and taking lines and putting them in the, in different spots? Well, like I say, the first couple of years for me, and I think for most people is sort of just gaining um, the ability to, to play the language. And, and it's maybe not as personal. I mean, I think a lot of people do. Certainly for me, it was just, I, I, I don't mean master, but it was sort of like getting the ability to, to just play eighth note lines running through a set of chord changes. And it felt very satisfying when I finally could do that because it was very frustrating for the first year where I, I just, when I would solo, I would just get, I would stop a lot because I couldn't get my lines to flow through. I mean, we're talking about some very specific heady stuff here, but. And wait, how old were you? Was this around 15, 16? 14. Okay. And I would say it was around the time that I was 15 that I all of a sudden it just all came together. It's like if you can have faith that the work that you do is going to pay off, then you're not worried about individual day results like, oh, you know, I still sound as sad as I did yesterday or, you know, worried about, oh, I'm a little better today. No, it's like do the work. Don't worry so much about it because ultimately, as long as you're practicing and doing the right kind of practicing and listening and working on all of your music at a certain point, it just gets better. And that's that's not even a choice. It will get better. So, of course, I didn't think about that. But I did practice for, for three hours a day or whatever after school. So was it three hours a day? Were, were you very consistent? 
you know, I wasn't I, I wasn't real consistent, but I would say during the, the Monday through Friday, sort of come home from school, that would be the thing that I would do before dinner. It was pretty much, you know, just practice, put on put on my lessons and, and listen to music and um, play along with records. I felt like, um, so I think, you know, it, it's a sort of a um, academic, necessary, but academic uh, process we go through where we, where we transcribe people's notes and we play them and we play them back. But what's so interesting is that at a certain point, if that's all you're doing, getting the notes, you're, you're, you're not actually transcribing the most important part and that's the environment. So the, you, you don't just transcribe a bunch of notes cause that that's part of it, but you have to transcribe the feeling, the spirituality behind what's going on in the soul. Like what are they feeling? Is it, are they creating a bluesy feeling here? Is this more frenetic? Is this, and when you put on the record, maybe instead of just playing the exact notes of the solos playing, the soloist, you play the implied sort of environments that they're coming up with. So are they expressing something? Are they playing louder? Are they leaving space? Are they developing a cell? Are they doing something funny with their sound. So do all of those things. It doesn't have to be the right notes or the same notes or whatever, but if you develop an instinct for creating solos that are balanced and, and that have a lot of spirituality in them. And I think we, as teachers and, and, and young players, we don't really think about that or teach that. Now, you mentioned some of your main alto influences. In another, there was a great interview you did with uh, Joff Woodwinds. I thought it was a really nice interview. Uh, you mentioned some of your main alto influences were Phil Woods, Cannonball Adderley, Bird. Could you talk? Okay, I'm, why don't we just, I'll just say a name and then maybe just give a few sentences just about that player and what really stands out to you for that particular player. So if I said Phil Woods. Absolute confidence and and security in his sound and his playing and his ideas. He's he had the most um, faultless technique. Uh, I felt that he really sang on his alto, and I, I loved his sound. What about Cannonball Adderley? You said you can't go wrong with with, with the recording from a cannon. Oh yeah. <laughs> so we'll talk about Cannonball Adderley. Well, also one of the most beautiful alto tones, but just absolute swing and spirit talking about spirituality his spirit and his swing just his the way he swings his eighth notes the way he uh, shapes his lines and articulates it's um it's just it's so personal and the thing is that you know we want to copy stuff like that and sound like that i know some people who do and well you know if you end up sounding like somebody else that's what you sound like not like yourself but it's so easy to want to sound like Cannonball. If I asked you, I said, Ted, what's the sound that you are going for? Do you consciously think of that or do you let other people come up with descriptions for your sound? When you're playing and practicing and, and working, do you, do you have something that you're shooting for? Not specifically. I, I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I know that um, it, rather, than, rather than break that down musically, I could break it down more emotionally. I know... In the beginning, I was trying to develop my technique, but I, I thought that people would be impressed if I could play a lot of notes. So um, one time, I remember I was playing at the Village Vanguard with the now the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra, but it was the Mel Lewis Jazz Orchestra at the time. I joined the band in the early 80s, and I was there for about nine years. And uh, people would come in there all the time because it was such a great band, with such a great history, and great music. One time I was about ready to solo on something and I looked over and Bob Berg had just sat down at the bar and Bob Berg who passed away about 10 years ago or so, maybe more, um, in a car accident was really one of the greatest, um, tenor players of all time. He was kind of, I include in this group of like New York seventies post train, um, tenor players who just he played with cedar walden's band i used to hear him all the time when i was 16 i used to go and hear him in la that band yeah it was billy higgins and bob and cedar tony dumas and i just i just revered bob berg i very nervously went up and introduced myself at the bar i think i was 16 and he was kind of cool to me and stuff and i i you know whatever so anyway now i'm in my 20s maybe 23 24 and he walks into the vanguard and sits down to listen and i I'm okay. My goal is set. I'm going to try to impress him. So I play a zillion notes. Now, you know, my solo wasn't that good. 
And who cares if he thinks I can play a lot of notes or if I have a great harmonic concept? If, if I'm not creating solos that are meaningful, eh, then it's not impressive. So I would say that what changes over the years, and maybe some people get to this younger, but for me it took a while, was that my goal was not to impress people, but to move them. Did you become friends with Bob? No, I didn't. And I didn't talk to him that night. And he was a friend of Dick Oates, who sat now next to, who sat next to me in a section. And I, and I, but I didn't, I was too shy to go talk to him or he may have left um, before I had a chance to, but I, I did not talk to him and I've n never really talked to him again. And that's, that's okay. I mean, you don't have to be friends with everybody. You, I, I've had experiences where I've not done things that I've really regretted. I can look back at a time that um, I was playing with Louis Belson. It was like a little, I don't know, not a workshop really, but it was at the drum center or, or something in um, downtown New York. And a bunch of drummers were there. I think I was already in the Mel Lewis band and Mel was there. So I was chatting with Mel and Louis, Louis and I played a few tunes with this quartet and Elvin Jones was there. And I was like, oh, my God, that's Elvin Jones. And so Elvin Jones came up to me. He goes, hey, man, you sound good. How old are you, man? Oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 20, 21, 22, whatever I was. He says, man, you, 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 yeah, you were playing something, man. We, man, I want you to come and come and sit in with my band on Monday night. We're playing down at the bottom line or whatever, bitter end or whatever it was. And uh, I was like, God, I was just petrified. And I just spent the next three days or whatever just scared and monday rolled around and i came up with all the whatever excuses i could and i, ne I didn't go oh wow and, okay and i had the opportunity to play with elvin jones and he invited me to come and play with him i did not go i never met him or played with him again or had the opportunity did you feel again you, you weren't ready yeah that's the thing you know you you go through these periods where you you feel insecure or you feel like maybe he should hear me when i'm when I've got my shit together, do you know what I mean? But I mean, like, at 16, you were like a lead alto, right, for Quincy Jones. That must have been pretty good for your confidence, right? It was for a certain amount of time. And I have to tell you that Los Angeles is a pretty big town, that's that's for sure. But as far as a jazz community goes, it's not like New York. So I was I was sort of a, a little bigger fish in a smaller pond in a sense that I was getting attention. Maybe some of it was because I was young. I'm 17 and whatever. I'm playing in these jazz clubs, playing people coming out to hear it, getting some reviews and, and all that. And so maybe I had a false sense of security or confidence. And then I said, okay, New York. That's my next step. 18 years old, moved to New York. And I was like, hey, ladies and gentlemen, I have arrived. I'm here. Let's go. And people were like, yeah. Cool, man. Get in the back of that line. You see that line? It goes all the way around the block. That's that's where you belong. And and that's so I just it there was like a period of maybe three, four years where although I was doing some gigs, my conf confidence went down a lot. I was also in a relationship with somebody and she was she was not very supportive of what I was trying to do. And I felt like that added to the sort of you know, development of, a, of an insecurity. But looking back, objectively speaking, how would you have gauged your playing? Um, I had a good harmonic knowledge I, and, it, and I could play through chord changes really well and play a lot of notes. But I wasn't really getting to something that was extremely personal, I would say, in the beginning. It started to happen for me in my 20s and, and certainly with the Mel Lewis band. I experimented a lot with my solos with either really embracing and the swing and the bebop style or sometimes really going towards something that was much freer and more outside or, you know, like trying to find ways of playing outside the chords but still make sense out of it. And so it was a good period for me to sort of experiment and figure out what my voice is by by trying a lot of different things and, and by, by experimenting and developing in a lot of different parts of your playing, you, you develop something that becomes who you are at a certain point, hopefully. I want to jump a little bit to composition and writing and arranging because you've been writing since you were 15, right? Maybe, was, or maybe even earlier. Were you always creative in the sense that you, you were writing? Well, I mean, I would say that, yeah, 15, I can remember the situation where I wrote my first tune. I was up at the Monterey Jazz Festival. I was part of the All-State High School Band up there. We are just, you know, an all-star band or whatever from the state. 
I think they call it the Next Generation Band or something. But it's um, back then it was just a all-star or all-state high school band. And I was sitting at the piano on a break, and I started writing this little bossa nova. And, yeah, very simple. And uh, I remember a guy named Lauren McClung played tenor uh, in the in the um, band with me. And uh, he's he he was like a year older than me, or is a year older than me. And had a little bit more knowledge of some harmony and stuff. And as I was struggling through this bridge, he came over to the piano and he kind of helped me with a couple of the chords. And I felt like I, by the by the time I finished writing this little song, it was complete. It was like an A A B A form. It had a bridge. Was that, that Trista Mente? Yeah, it was Trista Mente, and that's the one that ended up on Louis Belson's record. And so that was my first recorded song. Um, but I don't, you know, as far as writing little songs is one thing. I mean, being a composer, I, 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 I kind of want to differentiate between someone who's a songwriter or can write a little ditty and someone who's a composer. I mean, composing means, you know, you, you organize, you think of and organize uh, melodies and harmonies and rhythms to create something. It could be whatever it is. It could be a jingle. It could be a symphonic piece or anything. But um, I didn't really get more seriously into composing for maybe another 12, 15 years. I, would you say you're self-taught or did you teach yourself? Did you take uh, composition lessons or seek out a teacher to help you with composition when you were developing? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I, I think that with the background, with all the harmonic uh, understanding that I had from all the work I did as, as a jazz musician, there was a lot already in place so that I could understand about how to, how to compose sort of more intuitively. I did not study with anybody formally and I did not go to music school. I just came to New York. And when I was about 30, the ja the BMI Jazz Composers Workshop was maybe a year or two into its um, life. Uh, and that was a, a workshop that was taught by Bob Brookmeyer and Manny Album. And that workshop exists today. And I'm actually one of the teachers there. So it's, it's kind of come full circle. But that was an amazing um, experience just working under Bob Brookmeyer and Manny Album, and Bob had so many, so many ideas about te techniques that you could use to find new ways and explore new areas of music. That because sometimes you know we just we're we're set with the song form and we use the traditional harmony and cadences in a way that's been used so much. But like, what about jazz? Never really embraces like the 20th century classical stuff with uh, 12 tone rows or different ways of. So he was always trying to push you into finding new ways to compose. And I think that little two-year period did a lot for me in terms of opening me up. Now, as, a, as somebody who's, who's just a listener, would you say that you really have listened to a, a wide range of music over your life? Like you've listened to the Bartoks and the classical music, and you've also listened to lots of jazz recordings, and you, try, and you have a large library of sounds in your head? I'm somewhere in the middle. I, I'm, I definitely am surrounded by people who know everything that was ever played by anybody in the jazz idiom, and I, I'm not quite there, you know. And then there's people who know a lot more about, say, film music, or there's people that know every big band record by Count Count Basie, and there are people who know all about classical music or pop or R&B or, you know, there's just whatever it is. I, I feel like I have a little bit of a bunch of stuff in, in sort of my head from from listening, I particularly like classical music and, and, and 20th century classical music from the Impressionists up through, I love Berg a lot, Bartok, certainly Stravinsky. I remember when I was first writing for string quartet, I, I picked up, I bought the Bartok string quartets and I mean, I, it was, you know, I thought, oh great, I'm going to look through this stuff and I'm just going to absorb all this, but you know, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, come on. Um, but I'm not... And I feel like that's an area that I really, I still feel like I could listen to more music. I don't listen to enough music. I'm not, there are people who have earphones on or have something going on in the house, a record, uh, constantly listening to music all the time. I almost never listen to music unless I specifically want to listen to it. So like if I'm researching something, if I just feel like I really want to hear this type of music, I'll put on something and listen to it, but I don't listen to music around the clock like a lot of people I know. So it's I, I'm definitely not 
not as exposed to so much music as as some people. Now you have incredible. I mean, you're really a king when it comes to like big band and like your experience playing in multiple big bands, writing for big bands. So I have to ask you, when it comes to let's start with writing for for big bands, basic just just writing. So when did you get to start writing for big band charts, and uh, how did you develop in that area, and what was really good for you? Well, sitting in the Mel Lewis band was was an experience because we were playing Thad Jones music. When I joined the band, Bob Brookmeyer was the musical director. And so we were playing a lot of his newer music. He was using the band. He was uh, fi- figuring out new ways to compose for big band. And that was an exciting period, the early 80s. He, you could check out some of the records he did um, around 1980. And we were playing some of that music. Uh, Jerry Dodge and Bob Mincer. Um, there, were, there were a lot of different people who composed for that band and so just sitting there and hearing this amazing music night after night monday after monday around tours i said okay it's like you know that thing that you that you that you see or you hear and you're like what is that i want to know what that is like the first time i heard a dominant chord with a sharp 11 and i and i i was with my friend lauren mcclung who i mentioned and i said i looked at him some guy was playing and all of a sudden he played the sharp 11 and i was just i was like 15 I looked at Lauren. I just looked at him. He he knew exactly what I was talking about. He goes sharp eleven, and I looked back at the at the player. It was like you know you want to know these things. What what's the secret? What's that magical thing? Like how do you how do you write for a big band? How do you voice a brass section? So you just say okay. You listen. You 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 try to read some scores and you start. And I remember bringing in my first chart. I said, Mel, I, I'm I'm working on a chart. He says, Great, man, bring it down. We'll we'll read it. I said, What do you mean we'll read it? He goes, Yeah, we'll just we'll play it at the club. We'll just bring it down. I'm like, You don't you don't want to rehearse it? He goes, Nah, we never rehearse. Just you know, we'll sight read it at the club. We'll do it on the third set or something. We used to play three sets. We get done like two in the morning. And um, so I brought this thing down. I worked like a month on it. It just you know, and ah, and so I brought it down. And okay, let's play it. It lasted like three minutes. <laughs> and I was like, he goes, that's it? <laughs> he said that on the bandstand. He just said, that's it? I said, yeah, I guess I should write a little bit more, huh? And everyone was like, yeah, it's nice, very encouraging. But it's it's very very typical of being very young and for something to last three minutes. You know what I mean? So, um, but that was my first, my first chart. And then I said, okay, I want to do this. And so I just continued to write. And um, I mean, I felt like that about other things like acting. I, I was just always curious about actors and how they learn their craft. So I, I took a I took an acting class um, in New York for about three years and at the HB studio. And I, I sort of got to understand what it means and what it takes to be an actor. Not that I ever became a good actor, but it just I wanted to understand it. If someone were to ask you, what's the top of the top when it comes to big band arranging, could you drop a few names so that with all your knowledge, you can actually differentiate between the different big bands? So like, what's good examples of great writing, like really top of the top? So funny. You know, people often equate me and, and what I do with big bands because there have been so many that I've worked with. And, you know, I think as, as players, we always want to be in small bands because... <laughs> We have more solo space, and it's like, you know, we're always, we're always thinking, so, but, you know, big bands, they have five saxophones, you always fly at work. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, so I've been in a lot of big bands. I've heard a lot of writing. I, I would say the first big band where I really was interested in, the, in the, the writing that I heard live, that I was able to play with, was Toshiko Akiyoshi. She just... She was she was very um, rooted in Duke Ellington, but she had like these twists and turns to her ways of, of orchestrating and like her, very melodic, but her harmonic movement was very interesting and it was exotic. And you need know, to say, well, she's exotic. She's from Japan, and 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 so she's bringing these, and she did bring these elements of Japanese. I do recognize her name. She, I, I read, I remember her name from the Bud Powell biography. Yeah, well, you and you hit on that with the Bud Powell thing. She was a Bud Powell. She loved, she loved Bud Powell, and she even has, I think, one of the songs dedicated to him. But uh, she made a name when she started writing big band music, and her husband Lou Tabakin is a fantastic saxophonist and flautist, and would solo do a lot of the primary soloing in the band. But uh, that band just turned me on so much. I can't tell you how. When I first heard that band, I was 15. It was up at the Monterey Jazz Festival, and they were one of the performers at the festival. 
and uh, I heard them at some other high school festivals. And I was like, oh, my God, this is this is amazing. And it was very, like I said, exotic, but it was also st- strongly rooted in this Duke Ellington kind of style of Bill, Billy Strayhorn's uh, writing, who, who was one of the chief orchestrators for Duke Ellington. If you don't know Billy Strayhorn's music, you've got to check out his writing. It's so beautiful. <clears throat> but, um, uh, you know, then the coming out of the Basie tradition, I mean, really, you know, the big bands were swing era bands, primarily in the 30s and 40s bands. Once you got past the sort of the, the, the Creole New Orleans bands where everybody was improvising together, then Duke Ellington and some other people came around and they sort of organized the notes more, right? They they took all these improvisations and sort of the free form improv and organized it. And so if you get a large group of people, you have to organize them if you want to have a specific sound. Like if you want to go a certain direction, you have to organize them. So you you arrange them. And Duke Ellington started to do that. And so his bands started to get bigger. And then when you get to the 30s and 40s, now you've got these these big walls of sound of people just swinging together. The solos became not they became secondary, really, to the to the the purpose of the swing era was really for people to dance and feel good, especially post-war when there was a lot, you know, during the war and post-depression. So uh, then the bebop stuff that's kind of sprang wildly out of the swing era because, you know, we were done with the, all that. And now our artistry of improvisation became primary and that's when Charlie Parker did Gillespie. But the big bands, like there's always been an argument about the big bands and did they go away? Are they gone? Are they, you know, whatever. They've always been there, but they don't serve the same purpose. Now with Stan Kenton and different bands in the fifties, no longer are people dancing. It's more like concert music. Would you say? It's like concert music. Exactly. So once the big band became a concert, uh, music, then people started to, to write differently for the big band because no longer do you have to make people dance. Or, or inspire them to dance, you can just just create something that people can listen to. So it became a little bit more like, like classical music in a sense that people came and they sat and they listened. So the so again, now Basie was a band that was a swing era band that sort of crossed over and became a listening band. I mean, ben, Benny Goodman famously also did that, but Thad Jones was the trumpet player and started to arrange for the for the um, Basie band, and in the 60s, he left Basie and with Mel Lewis formed the Thad Jones Mel Lewis band. And I think Thad Jones became sort of the new exotic writer and uh, uh, composer, and that big band was the hottest thing, and they started playing at the Vanguard in 1966 or 1967, still there. Uh, and so there are a lot of big bands, and you, you kind of see the the lineage of w- where this music came from and how it continues through to, to today when a lot of there are a lot of big band composers that aren't doing this typical big band writing like uh, Darcy James Argue and Maria Schneider. Um, there's a lot of people that are trying to find new ways of using the, t- the big band or you know instrumentation to express something different. And uh, I really have a lot of respect for everybody who's figuring out different ways of expressing using that now with presidential suite i mean that you're harnessing all the resources of the uh, the lincoln uh, the jazz lincoln uh, center uh, or- orchestra and big band now there's some tremendous resources there at that point when you started writing that for that album were you did you have a lot of experience with big bands writing and, and would you say it was a culmination of all your training and everything so i guess the question would be when you seize that challenge, talk about that, the writing for that and how, well, how long did it take you to write everything and what were the challenges you faced? We're, hopefully we're always challenging ourselves. If we become um, satisfied with where we are, then we're not, we're not trying to grow. And I think even with the big band, I mean, I have a lot of experience writing big band charts and I would say that like sort of music for hire in a sense because the Jazz Link Center Orchestra we do a lot of themed concerts. I mean, it might be anything from the music of John Coltrane to Jazz Meets Brazil to uh, the music of Moacir Santos to, you know, whatever. We often have a theme. And uh, I've written so many big band charts over the past dozen years for Jazz Lingot Center. I think there's about 70 or 80 charts that I've written for the band. So my, my experience because of that 
means that I've, I've developed a craft. It means that I know how to orchestrate. I know the registers of the instruments. I know how to get a certain sound. But it doesn't mean I'm going to make creative choices all the time. I mean, that's, that's the thing. It's like, how do, you, how do you keep challenging yourself so that your new endeavors are creative? And the presidential suite was an opportunity for me to say, okay, what, how can I approach this music that's different? And by transcribing the speeches for their intonation and then using all that thematic material was extremely challenging for me to still put it into a context that felt that it, that it flowed, that it expressed, that it, it didn't sound crazy and wild because you still have to, you have to still make something that makes sense. Right. So, yeah. So we're always hopefully challenging ourselves and growing every, every time we write a new piece of music, it's an opportunity for us to learn a little bit, something new about ourselves, about the process. And hopefully our music keeps growing as a result. As someone with so much experience, what are three pieces of advice you'd give to somebody who's just learning big band writing? Well, uh, first of all, you have to understand the basic thing about harmony and about what the important parts of harmony is. If you take a trombone section and you want to see seven, three, let's say you have uh, four trombones, you're not going to just put one on a C, one on an E, one on a G, one on a B flat like that. Boom. It's so on the nose and it's flat sounding, I mean, emotionally. So you have to figure out how to invert sections to give to, to hit the primary tone. So you might give the bottom trombone an E, the next trombone a B flat, and then a D, the nine, and then you can put the G on top of that. And so you've spread out the voicing. You've 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 realized that you've you've outlined the most important part of the chord, the E and the B flat. And this is this is just basic stuff. You what I'm saying is you have to have a basic understanding of how to voice and how to make the section sound good and balanced and, and all that. You, you, a lot of time is spent in just figuring out how to voice band, the, the band, the or, you know, how to orchestrate. But then you have to, besides all of that, I mean, you have to, you have to understand about cadence and how to use cadences for, for tension and release and, and, and be able to have control over that. So you're creating emotional responses with the music. You're, you're saying you're building up something. You have to have... You have to be able to use the band to create emotional responses. And then, ultimately, you need to hear what's going on. If you're writing everything at the piano or on some instrument and you're just writing everything literally up and down, like uh, horizontally, like this chord, every voicing in this chord, and it moves, and then you listen to it, it's not flowing. So you, you have to sit back and you have to actually imagine how this arrangement is going to flow from beginning to end. And... If you hear something, you need to grab that. Like, what? what's next? Ted, do you write at the piano, or do you just try to give it to, an, to a big band and hear it through a big band as much as you can? I use the piano a lot because it's easier to hear four or five voices at a time when you're sitting at a chordal instrument to remind, you know, the more you do it, the more you know what a certain sound is going to sound like, and sometimes you don't need to sit at a chordal instrument and hear all the voices, but I use the piano for orchestration, but I try to do most of my creative work. In other words, really listen to what's happening, just just hear, listening and using my, my thoughts and my feelings and then trying to capture that. And then my, I might use the piano to capture certain things that I'm hearing. So the more, like I'm writing a bunch of music right now for string quartet and rhythm section uh, for some concerts we have next week with Eddie Daniels here at Jazz Lincoln Center, and I, I, I started to get even tired of my own process during this particular writing assignment. And I said, okay, I've got to find some new ways to write. So I sat back and I, I just started free form writing. It's, it's called like linear or through, like through line, line uh, writing. It's line writing. It's a certain style where you just write the lines and you let them accidentally uh, intersect each other or come together. And so a lot of the harmony that you get is more accidental, say, uh, and then you, the, the more you do it, the more you can actually guide that and be more in control of the harmony that comes out of it. But so, again, trying to always, always find new ways to do things. I want to talk about your new album, Live at Dizzy's. Now, we talked a lot about the big band stuff, but your real small combo stuff is just a really great playing as well. So now this, this is the latest album. Could you talk about the album and what was your goal with this album? Well, it's funny because the goal wasn't the album. 
and the, the, the goal was to put together a bunch of people I love to play with and do a gig. And basically, like I say, you know, we're all, regardless of what we're doing in terms of playing in big bands and all that, we love to solo and improvise. And so you put together a small band and it just gives you a lot more freedom. The, uh, I do spend a lot of time with jazz and Lincoln Center Orchestra and, and some of these projects that you mentioned, these big band projects, they're, um, they're bigger concepts and I don't really do a lot of improvising on it. So I felt like when we did the gig, it just felt so good. The Matt Wilson and his spontane spontaneity, uh, Rufus Reed, all that experience and beautiful sound that he brings to it. And Gary Versace, just, he's, he's such an intuitive player and Warren amazing. I mean, all such great musicians. The, the, the recording was live streamed and recorded. Uh, I mean, the, the gig was, was recorded. And when I listened to it, I said, you know, I just I want to put out a record where it's just playing, just improvising, and it's not you know big concept stuff. It's just this another opportunity to say like this is a side of me I want people to to check out, and I'm so excited to put this record out because I think it's the first time in over 25 years that I've put out something that was a live gig, and I th I think it just I want people to check it out because I I really do want them to hear all these great players. And to hear what comes about when people just go ahead and let themselves feel and be be in a, in a moment. How did you come to put the set list together for the, for this particular date? Well, it's um, it's a combination. It's got it's got some original tunes, uh, is, but it's it's a lot of standard. Uh, you know, that's like a Chick Corea tune, uh, Johnny Mandel's Emily. Uh, there's a Herbie Nichols tune, a Thelonious Monk tune. So it's kind of a cross section of some things that are a little quirky and all that. But for me, it, it just was a collection of, of opportunities to improvise and uh, you know, we just, you know, how we do. We, we set up, we make a set that hopefully balances through different styles and tempos and all that. But um, it just, the record was just released. So let me do a little bit of promo here. <laughs> it's, uh, it's called uh, Ted Nash Quintet Live at Dizzy's Club Coca-Cola. It's, everywhere you would normally get something amazon itunes you can it's hard copy there's vinyl 180 gram vinyl which i'm really excited about because i actually prefer vinyl and it's just and you can go to my website tednash.com um i'm gonna have links there so where you can get well we actually have these little packages which are cool like uh, sets of with cds the vinyl sheet music um and also wine um <laughs> uh, <laughs> i have a wine business with with the great singer um kristen lee Sargent, who's getting ready to put out her second record and she's um also a sommelier and a wine expert and we put together a uh, um a wine that is it's really delicious so we're also going to have that as part of the packages just saying you know if you like like a, a good full-bodied red um it's called Two Notes Wine. You can also look up twonoteswine.com uh, and you can check it out and see where it's being held. But so we're, we're out, you know, I'm offering some little packages, which is fun. So here, this is my big promo moment. Can I ask you a few of the tracks? Like, can we, could we talk about the tracks one by one? We have Epistrophe, Thelonious Monk's Epistrophe. Now, how did you come to choose that song and talk about, uh, talk about that, that track? Well, first of all, anything by Thelonious Monk is just is worth playing at any moment so uh an epistrophe is just it's such an interesting tune because of the way that the chord structure moves around and it and uh i, I don't want to get too technical but you can you can break chords as they're moving or you can ignore them and i love that i i, I love that style it's like you have a, a b flat seven go into a to a, a b7 and back and forth and you can either play the b7 or you can ignore it and let it move back and forth and uh, there's something about that, that playfulness of, of whether you embrace or ignore something. And I, I think, and then the bridge is just, is, is so beautiful. And we put a little reggae kind of beat on the top of that. And that was something that I was inspired after hearing a Chris Crenshaw, a big band arrangement of, uh, of that song. Uh, Wynton Marcellus, there's a very great quote. He play, uh, he's talking about Ted Nash here. He plays on a virtuosic level all of the reed instruments. He plays them all perfectly in tune and has a personality on each one that's different. And he can read music unbelievably well. So, I mean, <laughs> that's coming. I mean, anybody would die to, just to get a compliment from, from Wynton Marsalis, an amazing player. You guys are good friends. We've become really good friends. I was always a little nervous around him in the beginning because, well, he's Wynton Marsalis. And 
the first time I got called to sub on one of the band, one of the earlier Jazz Living Center Orchestra um, gigs, I was subbing at a rehearsal for Wes Anderson. And I came in and I sight read all the music. And I, I am a good sight reader. It's just something you do You when you play a lot in big bands, you do a lot of gigs where you have to sight read, you get good at it. I came in and Winton didn't understand that I was, he goes, did you get all this music in advance? Why, I don't understand. Why are you playing all this? I was like, no, no, I'm just reading it. And he goes, you can read like that? So he's always kind of messed with me about that, about my reading and about going back to that that first time that he heard me sight reading. And Ben Wolf was playing bass in the band. He goes, see, I told you, man, you can't play, man. So it's just like that kind of way of welcoming you into their their circle was it was really beautiful because sometimes you come into this situation now your uncle and your dad were studio sessions so they were were they great readers as well yeah they were just amazing readers is that something they imparted onto you or you practiced on your own or how did you develop your reading i mean you just i took private lessons and i sight read a lot of uh etudes on clarinet and things like that and then like just playing a lot of music in high school and then you start doing gigs. You got to read. You got to sight read. That's it. <laughs> maybe some people, maybe some people aren't very good at it. Maybe there's a talent for it. I think it's just any like anything. If you if you do it a lot, you get better at it. You're really good at a lot of instruments. How do you? What's your mindset when it comes to doubling? Is, is that just you? Just have to be. Is it part of the job profile in a way? And you just had to get good at it, or did you consciously want to be strong in a bunch of instruments? Well, uh, yes, and a lot of that, and I mean those are. Those are you just mentioned basically everything that that it involves. the The fact that I started on clarinet as a woodwind instrument was helpful because that's the harder I think of all of them, um, and and then found saxophone later. So that was a good order to, to take up things. The flute lagged behind for me because I felt like I always had a sort of airy sound and it wasn't really convincing as far as being like let's say a classical flute player or whatever. And I still feel like that, although. Because I did, at a certain point, a lot of Broadway shows and some studio work and all of that, I think I've developed my flute playing to the point where it's semi-convincing in, in all the different styles that I need to play at. But, you know, again, that's a commercial application for me. I love playing the flute now as, as a creative outlet. I love using it to, and I do play flute on this new record, the Live at Dizzy's record on Chick Corea's Windows, and I, I just feel more creative on it i didn't feel like very creative on it for a long time and that's what you were asking but for me it's a different color i feel like i do play differently on the different instruments i do play clarinet on the record as well i i it it gives me a little different feeling and i like that feeling all right i guess to end off i'm going to ask you a bunch of quick questions that are fun okay what's your proudest moment in music (laughs) (laughs) uh Ah, it's you know it's it's interesting when you talk about I, I know you don't want you want quick answers it's not the successes it's not awards it's when you when you when you get that thing that creative thing and you and you figure it out and you and you do it that for me that's the biggest reward so it's like multiple like in a way breakthroughs so to speak yeah okay um, who is your most important mentor figure uh, you seem like a really self driven guy but did you have a very important mentor figure that you that that's special to you. Well, my father, of course, was a big mentor just because of his attitude and how much he loved music and how happy he was playing music. Um, even though my uncle was a reed player, I didn't spend much time with him. But Charlie Shoemaker, my teacher, obviously really important. Winton, his Winton Marsalis, his seriousness and his diligence and his absolute being in the moment and is it, constantly an inspiration to me. So I would say that he's, even though he's my age, I mean he's a bit he's he's a mentor to me. For sure. All right. Now let's talk specifically saxophone. Who are your top three saxophone players? I mean, I have to go to Sonny Rollins. He just everything about what he does. It, he contains every aspect of music I find important. He's got humor. He's got swing. He's got um, intensity and emotional content. Uh, John Coltrane, obviously, uh, just the spirituality behind his playing and the new areas that he he discovered as a player. And um, I would. I would say that my my alto sort of faves have have shifted around. Charlie Parker has changed. I th- you know I mean I, because really that music is in everybody. But I th- I would say that in, in the last few years, Ornette Coleman has been a big influence on me. Okay, let's talk about classical composers. I, I really like to throw this at jazz musicians. So who are your top three classical composers? Well, maybe I'll say three styles because I, I I love Ravel and. Um, uh, 
Debussy and and De Tailleur, which is a little bit more of a contemporary of theirs, in that impressionist style. Wait, what's French, that? Th- obviously. Who's that third name? Uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. De Tailleur. He's How do you he spell comes that? out of the. Imp- oh, I, <laughs> Google it. Maybe maybe they'll maybe they'll find like a. I'll, I'll look it up. He's impressionist. It. Okay, um, wow. I was like, he's an impre- he's a, okay. He's a post-impressionist who died about mm, ten years ago. No kid. Okay. So he was, yeah. And then um, Alban Berg, my favorite, absolutely. Talk about Berg. Just give a couple of examples. Why do you like him particularly? He's from that second Viennese school, right? Yeah, he's he comes out of the more organized. Um, with rules and different things, he doesn't. He's not a twelve-tone composer necessarily, but he created a lot of sort of systems, and he uses the golden mean, which I really like, which is like that series of um, of climaxes. But what I love about him is it seems like he breaks his own rules uh, uh, to create something, and I, I like that. I like I like setting up rules Do and breaking them. You have a piece them. of Berg's that really hits you. I would, yeah, I would say that check out the opera Lulu, if. If just the Lulu Suite, that's that's amazing. Like there's a lot of great recordings of the Lulu Suite, and it just I can put that on and just go to a completely different place. So what what piece by Ravel do you like? Um, Daphnis and Chloe is probably you know my one of my favorites. And you have one more composer you have to mention. Well, I'm I'm torn between a lot of people. I mean I love Stravinsky and I I, I love uh, I love John Adams to be honest. I I. I got a chance to work and record with John Adams. Talk about John Adams. It's, it's he's more contemporary, but t- talk about his music. Well, he's got he's considered sort of a new age minimalist to some degree, which is a newer thing um, than say the 20th century classical, 20th century thing that I was talking about earlier. He, if if you ask him who his favorite musician and composer is, he says Duke Ellington. <laughs> which just the fact that just the fact that he says that is worth a lot because. <laughs> A lot of times people don't even recognize jazz or want to even talk about it. So that's cool. And when you listen to, say, Nixon in China, um, there are sections in there that are right out of Duke Ellington with the brass and, the, and like he loves trains. Duke Ellington loved trains. You could hear that in, in John Adams' music. He also, he also references uh, Impressionism and uh, romance in his music. So even though it's maybe got a serial minimalist bass, he has melody and he has passion in his music as well. And he's a cool dude. I really like him. I mean, you know, so I would say of the more modern stuff, he, he's somebody I really like. Now let's just make it as broad as possible. Top three musicians, just musicians, composers slash musician, who are just like your favorites? I love Joe Lovano. I love him and um, I love his group with Bill Frizzell and, and Paul Motion. I think they just found something that was really special. Very personal. The more and more I see people who just find something that's extremely personal, um, I love that. Gonzalo Ublacaba is one of the baddest dudes, period, period. Just, I love him. Um, and, um, I mean, I, you know, let me just go on. I mean, Charlie Hayden, or, you know, just there's just so many incredible musicians. Okay, and now the very final question is, the best piece of advice you could give to somebody who's wanting to learn jazz? The first thing is just, uh, you've got to listen a lot, and you've got to transcribe, and you've got to... Put yourself in these environments and then I, I would say just don't be afraid don't be afraid and that means in terms of your own expression um, putting yourself in situations meeting people because jazz is a community it's about people who play together it's about people who meet each other if you're sitting in your room and that's all you do you know it's, you know it's cool but it really it's about it's about coming together with other people so go to hear music Go introduce yourself. Go to jam sessions. All that stuff. Every single experience you have makes you a little stronger and develop a little bit more. The Ted Nash Quintet live at Dizzy's Club Coca Cola. When's it coming out, Ted? It just it just got released on May 18th, so it is out there. And we're doing we have a couple of gigs coming up with the band. June 16th is our first sort of CD release gig, and that's up at Music Mountain up in uh, up in Connecticut. So if you're if you're in the New York area, up in Connecticut, Music Mountain, you can just go to their website and check it out. And we're, we're opening up their season, their summer season. So that's exciting. We'll be back at Dizzy's in August, August 10th, 11th, 12th, the same band, 
playing all of this music and some other stuff. Ted, thank you so much for coming on the show. You are a phenomenal musician and just your, sharing your experience is just such a thrill for us at the show and it's just a, such an honor. All the best with your album. Uh, we're definitely going to check it out and buy it and encourage all my audience to buy it as well. So, Ted, thank you for coming on the show. Well, Nick, thank you for having me. I, I really appreciate what you're doing and I'm keep it going and uh, I'm going to keep following you. And, man, everybody just go to my website. Tell me what's up. Write me an email. Tell me what you're doing. TedNash.com. Thank you, Ted. Thank you so much for listening to my interview with the fantastic Ted Nash, who was so generous to give his time for this interview. If you enjoyed the interview, please take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes. It would mean a lot to me. Thank you again, and see you at the next show. 